Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. A quick correction before we get started. When describing activation functions in this episode, I say arctan a few times when I meant to say hyperbolic tangent function, or tanh. When dealing with real numbers, they look almost identical, and I think they might perform about the same. Maybe there's some computational reason to use one over the other. I have to think about that. That's a good question. But hyperbolic tangent is what you see in the literature more often, so please do an audible find and replace during this episode replacing arctan with tan h. If that sounds pedantic to you, or if that sounds like gibberish, don't worry about it. Lean back and just enjoy the episode. Mm, I've been baking yesterday a big carrot cake mm -hmm. and garbanzo bean banana bread. Which is quite good, even though it doesn't sound good. Did you try any? Oh, wait, I'm thinking of something else you made with garbanzo beans. What was it? Chocolate chip garbanzo beans. What about the pavlova? What is a pavlova, by the way? Most people don't know. It's like a meringue in that it's beaten egg whites with sugar. Except a pavlova is hard on the outside, soft on the inside, and a meringue is hard and dry all the way through. And so a pavlova is just harder to make and requires more skill, i.e. watching the oven cook. I just look for paleo recipes, and then I've been using fake sugar to see how it's turned out. All right, first, why paleo? What, what's your interest there? Because I want to cook with whole grains, and I want to cook with less sugar and more protein and more fiber and I just see. more fruits and veggies. Now talk to me more about this alternative sweetener stuff you get yourself into. Well, I pronounce it erythal. I don't know if that's really how it's pronounced. I've never heard anyone say it. It is a sugar alcohol that has zero impact on your calories and blood glucose level. And uh, how do you know how much to put in? On the package, it says one for one measurement to sugar. But I think it's less sweet than sugar. So I just keep tasting it and adding it as I feel. So tell me about that process. How do you go about doing that? Well, I stir it in, mm -hmm. and then I either get a spoon out or, or just use my finger and I lick it. All right, so anyone who ever gets offered a sweet by Linda, just be aware of finger was in there. I wash my hands. <laughs> Very sterile. If it's not sweet enough, do you just double the amount of erythal? No, I just keep adding a little bit at a time. Why not just dump the whole box in and see what happens? Well, I've definitely added too much salt and too much sugar to things. So you always want to be careful and add it slowly. You can't take it out. Yeah, so once you get kind of in the close range, then you want to move more slowly, right? Let's say if the correct amount to include in the recipe is two cups, and uh, at first you try a half a cup. You might not even taste the sweetness, and so now you got to dump a bunch more in, right? Well, I just like to go slow the whole way. Really? You would just put like one grain of sweetness in at a time? No one can measure one grain. Well, someone Unless you're an ant. Yeah, so you got this range of values you have to explore, you know, anywhere between minus infinity and, in, and positive infinity. But there's definitely a little range that's most relevant to you, right? So there's kind of like a, a midway point that is your best guess, and then you want to explore around that midway point. And that is slightly analogous to the idea of an activation function. So here's how these things work primarily in neural networks. You have some input signal. So maybe in our network, the inputs it takes are the amount from each ingredient, how much sugar, how much salt, how much flour, et cetera, et cetera. And the output we want to predict is how good it tastes on a scale of zero to one, something like that, where one is a perfect taste and zero is completely unpalatable. Have you ever had any zeros? Anything ever completely unpalatable you cooked? Definitely think there have been things I cooked and I was like, yeah, I'm going to eat that <laughs> and didn't touch it. So I eventually threw it away. I don't remember you botching anything. Maybe there were things that we ate slower than other things. But I think I we just didn't like it. I can't see you ever just like ruin the ingredients. But if you had a process that might help you do that, uh, correct for that a little bit, learn faster, would be to apply an activation function to how you explore the space. Do you remember the terms domain and range from your early math classes? Domain. What is a domain? Domain is the possible x values range i feel like range is just a set of numbers that is in between what do you mean by range well, range is the set of possible outputs of your function or maybe think of it as the y values you remember the sine wave right the sine wave has an infinite domain because you can put any value in 
but the sine function always gives you a number between 0 and 1. It has this nice feature of no matter what the inputs are, it maps to 0 to 1. That's a useful kind of property, right? So whatever somebody gives you, you know it's confined to some range. We have something similar that we use in activation functions, the sigmoid function, which we talked about before, related to logistic regression. The sigmoid, and there's going to be pictures of these in the show notes if anyone wants to check it out. As it goes to the more extreme values, like negative infinity, positive infinity, changing the x doesn't change the y very much. It stays the same. But around zero, changes in x are in places like a little bit amplified, or at least they have a big impact. So if you were trying to tune something and it was going through a sigmoid function, then most of your, the effectiveness of your tuning is going to happen right around the zero point where the bias is for that function. So the activation function does a couple of things for us. For any input we have, it's a, you take in all those inputs and it's like a pass-through. It maps the data from, from one set of numbers to another, usually in a bounded range. In a neural network, when you're training it, when you're getting it to learn things, everything is kind of in a state of flux because as you're optimizing it, you're potentially changing all the neurons every time. And you need some amount of consistency because you don't want to just say like, oh, double the sugar over there. Oh, now we have to double the flour to compensate. And the recipe gets all crazy. And maybe you're just jumping around different proportions of the same recipe, you know, like double the whole thing, triple the whole thing. You'd rather have one canonical recipe and optimize to that. One of the steps in finding a way to do that and making the neural network learn very well is to confine all the outputs to some nice range, like 0 to 1. That way you don't have these unbounded values where something keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and maybe in the next step it has to go more and more negative to compensate or something like that. These activation functions we commonly use also have nice properties. I mentioned sigmoid maps between 0 and 1. Can you guess why that might be useful? Well, it's always the same range, so right. you could compare it. That's true, and it's a little bit like a probability, right? You could say, you know, maybe it's the output represents, you know, the degree to which it was uh, had the right amount of salt or something. And uh, at one would be the perfect amount, at zero would be completely the wrong amount. And as you explore the space, you get closer and closer as you get to the, you know, best optimized value. Now, there are other ones like the arc tangent. That one is a similar shape, but it varies between minus one and one. Now, that one's interesting because now you have not only a, a, a gradient from zero to one of, you know, possible values, how important something is, but you also have the negative space, so from negative one to one. So you could kind of say like, oh, this recipe has too much sugar. I need to turn that down. You can't represent, you know, take something backwards if you only have positive numbers. That's kind of how we use a negative number. So in cases where maybe you want to penalize for something, you would use something like an arc tangent where it can be minus one to one. And that would tell you like, oh, you want to do less of one particular thing if it was a negative value. Similarly, there are things like the step function that would take whatever the input is. So it looks at all the, in the incoming data and says like, all right, if you're above some threshold, we'll give you the value of one. If you're below that threshold, you get the value of zero. And there's no real in-between. It's a very on-off switch, kind of a binary thing. So that might be useful in the recipe scenario if you're deciding, like, hey, maybe I should add a mystery ingredient. Like, should I put cherries in my pavlova? In it? Most yeah. people don't. They put it on top. So then in that case, if you tried a recipe where the cherries were inside, or at least you offered that as a possible input, maybe that network would learn with a step function, nope, set that to zero. Whenever there are cherries present, I'm going to say, I don't like this. Or at least that neuron is going to output a zero to kind of represent the fact that no added value came from putting the cherries in. Uh, another popular one, uh, just to mention, we'll probably do a whole episode on this one in particular and why it's good, is RELU, R-E-L-U, which is this weird abbreviation for Rectified Linear Unit. That one, if you're at or below zero, it sets the value to zero. Otherwise, it leaves it alone. So it has this kind of like nice gating property where it can kind of ignore certain inputs. Just if they become zero or negative, it turns them off. Anything positive, it leaves it alone. So these activation functions are there to serve different purposes and help your network optimize in the right direction. I think sigmoid, arctangent, ReLU, step, these are some of the popular ones. But it seems like there's tons of these out there that people are exploring all the time. And they're really good for helping you kind of confine the inputs you're given into a useful range and allow the optimization of the network to go a little bit more smoothly. When do you use them? 
I use these, well, technically some of these ideas are buried in a lot of different machine learning algorithms, but the places where I'm consciously thinking about activation functions are when I'm doing deep learning applications. So I'll put different types of activation functions on different layers of the network to try and get certain effects. You know, for example, in language, I found I was starting out doing some stuff with language using all sigmoids because that's what I was used to. And it would kind of say if something was present or not, you know, or, or how much a word, how important a word was to a sentence or to a document. But then I discovered that some things actually kind of need to negate the value of the document. And so when I started putting arctangent in there, the network was able to capture some of those properties. You know, like the word not is especially tricky in language. I do not like your pavlova is a very different statement from I like your pavlova. They differ by only one word. But the presence of that word contributes, you know, this negative sentiment, if you will. So you need something that can capture that. Uh, negative kind of um, association that you'd have with an input. And that's where I started using arctangent to good success. So I, I just need to know, what do you think of my latest carrot cake? Oh, it's delicious. Have you tried it? Yeah, yeah. I had a piece yesterday and a piece uh, this morning. The carrot cake? Yeah. You liked it? Is it not sweet enough? Well, it's less defined like here. What are we talking about? What, what's your objective function? I'm just asking a personal opinion question. Well, we, we can be optimizing for different things. Do I like it is a different question of should we serve it when guests come over? Well, what's your answer to both? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take those off the air. I must know. You could edit it out, but you have to answer. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. I don't know if I'd serve it for guests, but I like it. But if I put icing on it? Well, you could put icing on just about anything and you serve it. That's no big deal. Then I could serve it to guests. Yeah, that's no problem. Then you're just eating icing. Who cares? That's what I was thinking. I think I should make icing for it. So you could trick people into finishing it off because you made a giant pan of it? I just thought it would taste better with icing. Yeah, a little bit of icing might help. Now, if you had made a whole ton of these and made them all in different ways and used a neural network to learn which was the best recipe, maybe the step function would be appropriate here. Should I add icing, yes or no? Or maybe it should be the uh, sigmoid, you know, which would kind of measure the, deg- the amount of icing that should be involved. But by just doing it randomly, you never build the underlying mathematical model of how to make a delicious whatever it is you're making. How does one build that? Well, um, what are your control inputs? They are all the quantities of ingredients and then a few things like the temperature you cook it at, the time you cook it for. And those all have a range of options, right? Actually, this is a great example of where you use an activation function. So one thing you have to consider is how long do I bake it for? And your choice is between zero minutes and infinity minutes. Because, of course, as far as I can tell, the physicists have yet to figure out how to negative bake something. So we'll start at zero, goes to infinity. But, of course, baking it for eight hours versus 80 hours probably is going to have the same effect, I would imagine, right? Mm -hmm. So if you used a sigmoid, you can help to kind of isolate the useful range to explore and where um, your optimization is likely to look or look more readily to find a good value that's uh, descriptive of that your optimization can use when it's searching for the ideal bake time. So if you're going to use machine learning in some way, you would just set all those inputs up, provide a bunch of examples of things you've done in the past, and then score each of them. Say, you know, how delicious it was. And it can try and learn the right combination of ingredients and other inputs like cooking time and temperature that produces the most delicious version of the recipe. I think by that time, I would have gotten tired of cooking it and you would have gotten tired of eating it. Yeah, that may very well be true. Uh, It does take a lot of data to do machine learning in most cases, but eventually we'll do a mini on one-shot learning, which tries to balance out this major thirst for data that most algorithms have. Well, thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you, Kyle. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab. 